Good morning. Uh, two of the other committed ones who are here in the morning as the sort of Auckland gently wakes up. You guys are already up and, and at it and ready for um, the conference to begin. And, and that's good. That means that uh, you're in a frame of mind. I hope to take the most out of today's session of the conference generally. Uh, I will uh, commit to making sure that we finish today in time to get you upstairs for the keynote address. And uh, for that reason, um, as I said to Jeremy, you know, let's start in the still editing, that's fine. You eat away, I'll just watch and drool. Um, so, um, uh, I was pointed this way, I'd forgotten about the America's Cup, I didn't realise they were still running that. So I thought they stopped that in about 1983. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't hear a lot about uh, that anymore. Oi, oi. <clears throat> it was at a conference uh, much like this, uh, a room very similar, a breakfast meeting uh, actually, uh, at the Intercontinental Hotel in Sydney in Australia that a group of people, uh, a bit like you, except that they were um, engineers, IT engineers from IBM gathered in 2007. And the speaker at the lectern that day uh, was a well-known, well-regarded um, uh, engineer whose specialisation was <laughs> IT and privacy issues. And you can imagine 2007 cast your mind back, you know, the whole thing about privacy and the internet and the digital world was a really um, a pressing issue and an important issue. And so this well-regarded uh, IT engineer from IBM's uh, knowledge management uh, division standing there, and he had a wealth of data that he needed the people in the audience to understand. A wealth of things that they needed to get their head around and respond to and work through and deal with as it related to issues of privacy and the changing uh, landscape of the digital world. And he presented um, elegantly, and he presented articulately, and he had one of those sort of um, deep resonant voices that sort of rumbled out across the audience. He sort of had this gravitas about him. And he had slides, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentation. I think we'd, we'd moved beyond the sort of putting the, the old transparencies on the overhead projector. He had PowerPoint. Um, and he spent quite some time, 45, 50 minutes, talking about these issues of privacy in the IT area as the audience sat there. And he finished, and he moved back to his seat. And the next speaker was a chap by the name of Sean Callahan, who he knew well, who'd also worked in IBM's knowledge management area. And uh, Sean had uh, checked in with Ken and said to the audience, hey, listen, we've listened to Ken now for something like 45 minutes. We've listened to him talk about something that really matters to us, that is important. And it was clear that he knew his stuff, and he shared with us much of that that he knows. And if I was to think through his presentation, which I happen to have a copy of, he made five key points. Five things which I think he really wants you to take away today. Can anyone stand up and name those five things? And never in the history of that hotel had the carpet become more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make eye contact. We know what happens if you make eye contact. You'll get volunteered. And they sat there and not a word was said. And Sean said, never mind, never mind, like, listen, I don't even know why I asked that. Listen, Ken told two stories. Can anyone name the stories that Ken told? <laughs> and out of a group of 170 odd <coughs> engineers, now about two thirds of the hands went up of people who were prepared to stand up and say, yes, he told the two stories, I can name them there. Do you know, as architects of change, as people who are responsible for seeing new things happen in our organisations, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we know. Things that matter, <coughs> things that are important, that we need others to understand, to believe in, to act on, to move forward with. And we spend our time sharing that with them and often uh, they don't understand a word we say. They don't remember the things we need them to. But there's hope. There's a way that we can help people remember our message, believe in our message and act on our message and it's through the power of story. And that's what we're gonna spend this morning thinking about. It's hard when we share the information that we share in, in our working environments because try as we might to be clear and articulate and concise and considered in our communications, uh, we all of us suffer from a thing called the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge works like this. I will ask you in a moment to put down your knives and forks because I want you to find the person next to you. That's going to be really easy for you guys to be. Talk about the exclusive table. We talked about the exclusive gathering. This is the exclusive table of the exclusive gathering. I want you now to find a partner. The person next to you would be easiest. And I want you to do this. I want to so do that. Just make sure you're in pairs. You're in pairs. <laughs> 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 
Half a waste system. Or a three if required, but if there's a couple of threes, we might make a pair. Good. That wasn't exercise, but well done. So it was for a good start. Okay, I want one person in each pair to put up their hand, please. One person in each pair to put up their hand. Okay, I want you to point to the other person and go, you go first. <laughs> so it's good to volunteer. It's good to volunteer. Right, here's the deal. Here's what I'd like you to do, if you will. The person who's going first, I'm going to designate you tappers. Tap, not, not Spanish food, tappers, yes? Tappers. And the second person, the person who's, uh, who's left in the pair, I'm going to designate you as listeners. <coughs> and here's the task. Tappers, I want you to think now of a tune, a song, a song that most of us would know. So if you're into weird indie rock or something, just let that go. <laughs> you know, so that just something that most of us would know. A tune that will be recognised by many in the room. And then what I want you to do in a moment, not yet, but in a moment, I want you to tap that tune for your listener partner. Don't tell them what it is, just tap the tune. <coughs> tap it through and then ask them today, can they recognise it? If they can't, that's okay. Just do it again <coughs> and help them the second time. But don't tell them still. And if after two times they don't get it, then tell them what it is, put them out of the mystery. Yeah? Is that clear as, as sort of a process? Yeah. Yeah. You're with your pairs, you know who's a tapper, your turn now, start tapping, away you go. Alrighty. 
So then, let me ask this. Who, new listeners this time, so swapping. Yeah, um, tappers. Who had a good listener? Who heard the message first time? Okay, so that's still about four. Who got it the second time? Yeah, a couple, three or four again. And again, most of you, yeah, still remain mysterious the whole time. <laughs> Listen, it's not your fault. Yeah, it's not your fault. We suffer from this thing called the curse of knowledge. And that is when we're communicating messages, we can't not know what we know. We've got this entire backstory behind us, this body of knowledge, this sort of stuff that sits behind the story. And when we're tapping, it's the same thing. It's like we can't not hear the entire, like the lead break and the drum solo in the background, the whole symphonic version. And all that's coming out is this sort of demonic, sort of nutty <laughs> tapping, yeah? It's a bit like that as architects of change. We've got these important messages that we need to share with our people. And we tell them these things in ways that should make sense, that we think are clear, but we can't not know what we know. We can't take the full symphonic version with us, and all we do is this weird demonic tapping in organisations. I've been working with change as a change practitioner in banking finance, in television, uh, teaching at uh, two universities now for many, many years. And um, sure, I see some dumb ideas with change, but mainly I see good ideas with change that no one understands, that aren't implemented. It's not that the core idea is flawed, it's that the implementation is flawed. It's often because people are not aligned and not understanding the messages. So we suffer from this curse of knowledge. We can do better. And one of the ways we can do better is through story. Through thinking about the way we share our messages, share our stories. And it's not always you know, carrying the whole backstory with us. So let's think about probably the oldest model of, um, of uh, rhetoric, if you like. Oh, by the way, that exercise was first done by a woman by the name of, or first research, by a woman by the name of Elizabeth Newton, a PhD candidate at Stanford. And she, uh, in her first experiment, her first rounds of experiment, had something like 120 participants, uh, just as you, labelled tappers or listeners. They got to select from a list of tunes, there are 25 tunes in the list, but they were tunes that most Americans would know. They were Happy Birthday to You or, you know, Star Spangled Banner or who did you say? Who did that? Did they? Someone did that? Um, and uh, did the same thing. And before tapping, they were asked, OK, tappers, who thinks their listener will get the, list will get the message? Now, they weren't delusional. They didn't all say, oh, yes, me, me absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it was about 50-50 said, um, yeah, I think my listener will get the message. In fact, the data of Foster experiments show that something like 4% of people got the message each time. Uh, and yet it was un yeah, inconceivable to the tapper that you couldn't understand what this tune was, as it might have been for some of you. And it might be that way with our change messages as well. It's inconceivable that they don't understand why we need to change how we need to change, when we need to change, what's expected of them, what's expected of you. And yet they don't. So um, let's talk about the way that messages are often shared inside organisations, uh, particularly as we move through moments of change. How do we engage people with the compelling case for change? Um, and uh, so let's go right back um, to the sort of the granddaddy of uh, communication models, of course, to Aristotle's work. Uh, he talked about um, uh, rhetoric has been uh, ways we might uh, persuade people towards a particular point of view and move them to action. And he had three broad categories that he talked about. And the first, of course, was logos, to use rationality and logic, to use data and facts as a way to build a compelling case. If you simply see it laid out in front of you, it makes absolute sense. Why wouldn't you get on board? The second one is pathos, stories that speak to us emotionally stories that engage us at some deeper level than just you know, cerebrally. So Logos speaks to the cerebral brain, Pathos speaks to the limbic brain. And finally, Ethos. And this says, um, trust me, and therefore trust my message. <coughs> this is a message coming from me, though that's why you need to believe it. Yeah. And we use, we can use, we have available all these methods. We can talk through data <coughs> and logic, and reason and rationality. We can talk uh, through emotion and connection, um, or we can bring messages that come from us and we're trustworthy and therefore we should follow. Can I ask, uh, I'm always interested, um, uh, and it doesn't seem to matter where, um, where I ask this question, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia or in Southeast Asia or elsewhere. In your organisation, 
uh, which one gets used the most? Logos? Yeah. So if it's, can I just, uh, sorry, uh, just so I can't do a Vulcan mind meld, if I can see a show of hands. In, in whose organisation would, would Logos, you know, providing the facts and the data and the, the figure, yeah, as a way of saying, here's what we need to do. Yeah, this is uh, probably the case. Um, um, pathos? Yeah, so there's a few there. Absolutely. Which industry are you in? Health. Health, absolutely. Yeah. Health. Health, again. Yeah. Uh, so there's a pattern. That's right. Um, so and we're not saying it doesn't get used, but there's a bias. There's a bias in organisational life. Yeah. Uh, we're going to spend some time thinking about why we, we know you'll do logos. We know your organisations will present litanies of facts and figures and data and rationality. Let's think about how we might use those other two as methods of communication, as modes of persuasion to move people towards your change initiative. Um, and so we do that through story. And when we're teaching this in MBAs, we don't call it story because that doesn't sound highfalutin enough. We talk about narrative persuasion. <laughs> yeah? So there's nothing like providing a fancy label to something old fashioned. Um, so uh, through the power of story uh, or narrative persuasion, we can speak to people in different ways. And it works for a couple of reasons. It works because there's something in us as human beings which looks for closure. Something that wants things to be tidied up, to be ended or concluded. It's why the old matinees, the old movies would always you know, end with someone tied to the railway line and you had to come back next week to find out whether they survived. And you kind of knew they were going to anyway, but we had to come back. It's why every uh, soap opera or um, you know, a series has a cliffhanger at the end, so you come back for the next season. We love this idea of closure. Has anyone ever seen Billy Connolly? Yeah? Do you know how he starts a story? And he starts a story and he sort of wanders off and he starts another story and he has a bit of a laugh and a chatter and wander around. And then about 25 minutes later he comes back to this story that he never... And everyone's going, oh, it's so satisfying. <laughs> it's like this hilarity. Oh, that's, we'd, we hadn't really forgotten about it. You didn't fit and now you have, yeah? There's something so satisfying about conclusion. And so this is one of the structures that stories gives us is is it creates a sort of a, a, a puzzlement or a, a moment of, you know, what's going to happen? Where are we going with this? And as human beings, we want to know. And so at the end, in a story, or any kind, we kind of have resolution. And through that, we get this sort of tension release of, ah, oh, <coughs> that's how it ends. And in the middle is active listening. Because even if we think we're not listening anymore, we're still listening for that story that hasn't been finished yet. We haven't got time today, but there's a lovely thing called nested loops, which is exactly what Billy Connolly does. Starting a story, not completing. And maybe starting a second one, not completing. And then finishing at the end. You know, people, you know, and that whole time, people are still just tuned in. But that story, you haven't finished yet. So it creates active listening. If we want people to listen to our messages, story is a way of doing that. But it also does something else. It gives us uh, a positive payout. Uh, the resolution, the insight of the story, the, the punchline of the joke, the end of the, um, the, the tale, actually that satisfaction gives us um, a release of endorphins into the brain. It's, it is genuinely satisfying you know, in a physiological sense. So that's kind of how it works. Um, does it work? Well, there was another study done, um, another US professor who had a, a series of MBA uh, classes and his proposition that he put to this class was, uh, the firm we are studying today is a firm that uh, avoids, if possible, retrenchments or, or layoffs, as the Americans would say. Yeah? So here's his, his proposition, that the firm we're studying is a firm that avoids layoffs. And for the first class, what he showed was the statistical data that clearly showed this was the case. The data that said, here's the economic cycle, and even when it's going down, there's no matching, you know, correlating data that suggests staff numbers going down as well, uh, showing you know, particular points where they'd lost big contracts or things that happen that you would expect, you know, the data to follow in terms of um, employment and retrenchments. And it was clear that there was no correlation between you know, any of these sort of factors that might drive uh, a downturn in staff numbers and the choices the organisation made to drive down staff numbers. So this, the data was there. The second group, he told a story. He simply told, a, and well, I don't mean it's got a frog and a you know, prince there, but it's not that kind of story. It was, he told a moment <laughs> where you would expect an organisation like this, faced with these kind of circumstances, 
to have retrenched people and they didn't. So an incident that you'd expect them to lay off people and they didn't. The third group he gave both, gave the data and the story, he said here's the facts and figures that prove my case and let me tell you about a time that kind of shows this. Uh, and the final group he showed the uh, relevant uh, policy document that said, you know, uh, wherever possible we will avoid uh, um, uh, you know, uh, policies of layoffs, so uh, we won't do this. This is, this is in the, enshrined in our documentation. And what he was measuring was, the, um, through his research, the um, extent to which people will buy into that argument or believe that proposition to be true. And not surprisingly, I won't even ask you, uh, the least uh, compelling was the policy document just because it's in the regulations or in your uh, policy uh, people don't believe it's a case the case until they see it. Uh, the um, third least or the third most um, successful strategy was just providing the statistical data. Actually the second was the story and the data and the most effective way of convincing people of the proposition that the firm would not uh, have layoffs in times that you think they would, was telling the story. And people inferred from that story, from the fractal nature of that story, that incident was representative of the organisation overall. So story allows us to speak to the limbic brain. Stories are a kind of a pull strategy. We think we make decisions rationally. We, we like to think that we base our decisions on facts and figure and data and you know, stuff that's logical. Um, but in fact, what we do is we look for data we like. And if we like data, we embrace it and accept it and sometimes embellish it. And if we don't like data, we distort it or ignore it or disregard it. And so what story sometimes does is as a pull strategy, it creates space for us to like the data that's provided afterwards. And so if you live in a world where uh, you'd say, yeah, but Cameron, I can't just tell stories in my place. You know, that's not going to work. Uh, my chief executive, if I say, hey, you know, listen, boss, I've got a story for you. Uh, that's not going to be enough, then if you're going to do both, tell the story first, which opens up the space cognitively to allow in the facts that follow that support your case. <coughs> so, story works because it makes us listen harder. Story works because it satisfies us when it comes to conclusions. Story works because it speaks in a different way beyond the logos that many of us are accustomed to hearing and providing. Um, and it opens up our minds to receive the facts and data that we might need to provide anyway. <coughs> so, enough from me again. I'm not going to talk the whole time. Uh, I want you to, uh, in your same pair, why not? You've started a, a strong working relationship there. Let's continue that on. <laughs> um, I want you to do this. Uh, each of you for a moment, I want you to think of a time when you've had an experience and you learned something from it. I don't care when it was or how great it was, you didn't have to have learned how to split the atom or you know, this is just something that has happened in your life and you learned something from that ex incident or experience. And um, with your partner, just share that. Time starts now. Let me break into your stories. Who heard an interesting story? So who hasn't got the hand up? <laughs> so um, I want to dispel one of the myths uh, that sometimes sits with us. Uh, and that is people who say, ah, oh, yeah, but I'm not a storyteller. Yeah? When we're talking about narrative persuasion, when we're talking about stories inside organisations for the purposes of leading change, I'm not talking about yarning. I'm not talking about being a raconteur. You don't have to be a joke teller. You don't have to be the life of the party. You don't have to be you know, the person who's always got a story to tell. There's a purposefulness about this kind of storytelling that we can all do. Yeah? We're all storytellers. All of us, every day, we come back and we tell a story about what happened on the weekend or what just happened at lunch or what happened in that meeting I was just in. We're all storytellers. It's in us you know, quite deeply. Our written tradition is not nearly as like PowerPoint tradition is quite short. Our you know, written tradition is a bit longer. Our storytelling tradition sits deeply, deeply within us. We're all storytellers. The difference is some of us tell stories with purpose and some of us tell stories without purpose. So some people do just like to yarn. Yeah? And I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about the ways we might purposefully tell stories to help people understand the important change messages that we have that we need them to hear, really hear. 
to understand, to believe in, to act on. And there are ways we can do that, even those of us who don't think of ourselves as raconteurs. Story does sit deeply within us. Um, uh, this quote from Ursula de Guin, um, you know, there have been st- uh, societies that have not used the wheel, but all societies use story. Yeah? All societies that use story. And it's, you think about growing up. You know, half the fairy tales and story books that we either read or we read our children have got messages in them, haven't they? About how to behave, how to act appropriately. It's the same thing inside organisation. What we're saying is there's a new set of things we want you to understand and do and, and act on. And we want you to say this is what appropriate behaviour looks like going forward. We all tell stories. It's about telling stories with purpose. Let's, um, yeah, let's talk about the ways we can use stories in organisation. There are the three key ways that um, are available to you. And the first is uh, to tell stories. And we'll talk about that in a moment more. How might I tell stories with purpose to help uh, move my change forward? The second thing we can do is either listen for or elicit stories. We can ask people to tell stories and we find out what's really going on. So we're in the stage of change of really trying to do data gathering and and temperature check and stakeholder analysis and kind of get a handle on what's going on and where our change is. Um, uh, Looking at the data will only tell you so much. Getting people to tell you incidents is a really powerful way of capturing data. So we can use stories as a capture. Uh, By the way, you can also listen to stories and reuse them. You can listen and then tell. Yep. Uh, I'm going to tell second, several second-hand stories uh, today uh, quite intentionally. And the third way, though, you can use stories to, is to trigger them. This one's trickier, uh, but this is about performing acts that become legends. And uh, this is one of my second-hand stories. Um, I've been told this story twice by two people who don't know each other, who both worked for the Mars group of companies. Yeah. And both of them happen to have worked in what uh, is their dog food processing plant in country in the border of New South Wales and Victoria and Australia. Uh, it used to be called Uncle Ben's. I guess these days it's um, Pedigree Pal or something. And um, they both told me this story independently. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Mars group of companies. It's quite an idiosyncratic group of companies, family owned, family run by the Mars family. And they tour the world from time to time. I'm not sure if they're still alive, but they, this, this is a very old story, actually. This is part of its um, strength. Uh, touring the world, checking out what's going on, uh, tasting the product everywhere they go, tasting the spices, tasting the Mars bars, tasting the dog food. <coughs> They're a bit wacky, uh, but you know, maybe, anyway, they're a bit wacky. Uh, one of their policies, one of the culture, uh, cultural elements of their organisation is the place is open plan. Yep, uh, very egalitarian. So for instance, in Albury Wodonga, the factory, I haven't been there for years and years and years, but it's um, you know, factory on one side, uh, office environment on the other side. In the middle is the sort of shared area, the staff canteen is there, and everyone kind of has lunch there. Uh, and you're just expected to sit down to, with the person next to you. And it might be the guy who's you know, squeezing the, the gizzards into the sausage making machine, you know, ends up with the chief financial officer sitting next to him or her. And what a great way to find out that the machine's broken down three times this month and maybe we need to depreciate it and plan for a new capital expenditure. You know, so it's all very egalitarian um, and no offices anywhere, anywhere. And many years ago, probably something like 15 years ago now, uh, a new HR manager came in uh, from outside the Mars group, came into Mars and said, yeah, I get that absolutely. I'm all about egalitarianism. I'm all about you know, open plan and fostering communication and collaboration and stuff. But I have the kind of conversations that uh, need some privacy. You know, I have conversations with people about their futures, about underperformance, where people are sometimes upset or distressed or whatever, and uh, I just need the privacy that an office provides to have that kind of safe environment for those kind of conversations. And uh, this HR manager had a modest office built to conduct those kind of meetings uh, that, uh, that she worked in. And uh, next time old man Mars comes around for the company visit, uh, comes into the office environment, sees the office, picks up a chair, throws it through the panel of the office and says, I want that gone by tomorrow and whoever built it and moves on. (laughs) No more is said. Now, I'm telling you that story 15 years later that was told to me by two people who don't know each other, who worked for the Mars group of companies. It's a legend that symbolises what matters at that place. 
egalitarianism, you know, openness, transparency, captured in that story is a whole bunch of stuff that gets passed down in a very powerful way that you know, having a policy document wouldn't even come close to. So through triggering events, we can also use story. We can tell stories, we can listen or elicit for stories, and we can trigger stories. I'm not suggesting also that you throw chairs around the office, but you might want to think about what symbolic acts that you or those that you have access to can perform that create stories that matter. But let's talk about telling stories because that's one of the ones we can work with today. And uh, we're going to think about two sorts of stories today that are useful story structures for moving organisations through change. And the first one uh, is what Stephen Denning um, uh, calls a springboard story because it's designed to springboard you through, move you through resistance to change. When you've got change and you're encountering resistance, it's kind of the emotional you know, anxiety that people have attached to the change. It might be about competence concerns or it might be around um, you know, loss of, of the things that they hold dear or you know, the, sort of the various losses that occur through change. Because uh, change does incur loss. I've I'm always um, uh, spent some time at Harvard three years ago now um, with um, uh, Ronnie Heifetz and Marty Linsky. Some of you might know them. And I have these words of Marty Linsky in my brain. He always says, you know, whenever I hear organisations talk about change as being win-win, I know nothing important is about to happen. <laughs> because not everyone does win through change. Yeah? And so there is an anxiety and sometimes a resistance and sometimes legitimately so. But springboard stories help us move through that and they have a specific structure to them. A springboard story, the first thing is um, in writing a springboard story, you need to be very clear about why you're writing it. Is this a story about um, uh, you know, the time someone f uh, was fearful of being uh, incompetent and found out that it didn't really matter? You know, was it a time when they uh, were scared about something and did it anyway and it turned out to be okay? Well, what's the purpose of the story here? Is it about you know, putting something off that you know, bad news doesn't get better with time and you know, let's get the hard stuff done early? Think about what is the resistance I'm encountering? What is the story about? The second thing is uh, it's based on a true story. This is not asking you to write fiction. This is asking you, as you just did a moment ago, to think about a time when something happened that's essential, not essential, that is an, a, an event that is truthful. It doesn't have to also, by, by the way, be your truth. I mean, I just told you a story about Mars that I've never worked for, yeah, but it's truthful. Um, the third and fourth is the story is told from the point of view of a single protagonist. It's about someone and their journey, if you like, because that's who you're speaking to not to a group of people, but to a series of individuals. So you want them to relate to the story. So you also want the protagonist to be typical of the audience, that they can go, oh, that's a bit like me. You don't want to, you don't want to tell them that, so this story is just like you. Yeah. But you want them to kind of go, oh yeah, that's a bit like me, isn't it? Number five, it's useful to provide a date and location. There's something about anchoring it in a time and place that adds credibility and believability to the story. At 2007, the Sydney Intercontinental, the breakfast meeting of the IBM, you know. So adding times and dates seems to help stories. Number six, it's told in a minimalist fashion. Remember, what you want to do is you want people to project their own experience into the story. And if you're too specific, then it's no longer a story that's really about them. So it has to be general. So don't talk about your character unless it's you. And even if it's you, be, you, know, you can be slightly vague. Um, but if it's about someone, don't describe them you know, as being a particular age or you know, ethnicity or anything, unless that's a really important element of the story. But make it blank enough that it doesn't matter. Anyone can kind of imagine themselves in that story. <clears throat> Number seven, um, there has to be kind of a do-nothing um, result. Like if uh, there's a moment, and if they don't face into this moment, if they continue to resist, then there's some adverse consequence. Uh, number eight, uh, it has to end happily. Uh, you're trying to move people towards the change, not make them fearful of it, so you know, let's make it end well. <clears throat> and number nine, uh, then we come back and link it to the purpose. Not so, so that's my, you know, my message is bang, but just kind of tease people back to, number one, why we're we using this story in the first place. Um, uh, it's quite a list. Um, uh, I can make my, these available to you afterwards if you're still writing because I want to uh, share um, uh, a story, a springboard story. <clears throat> um, and this is a story that was uh, told to me by um, Gabriel Dolan and um, 
uh, Yamini Naidu, uh, who is two people who work with Story in, in Australia. And um, I, so I worked in banking finance for 10 years, so this story certainly uh, can relate to it. I worked in banking finance at a time when banks were transitioning from being banks <laughs> capital B banking, where they're about lending money and getting most of it back. They're about taking in coin and counting it and being transactionally accurate and doing international transactions and things, to all of a sudden they became retailers of financial services. And they weren't running branches anymore, they were running you know, retail outlets. Yeah? And they were changing the way they went about it. And branch managers, therefore, had to move from being um, you know, largely... Uh, as yes, they were, largely middle-aged men, <coughs> male, pale and stale, as uh, someone described them the other day, um, uh, who, you know, um, took the money in and gave it back and, and, and organised things administratively and, and what have you. So now they were sales managers, essentially, and retail managers. And, yeah. And uh, Phil Jones, an area manager, regional manager with one of the big banks in Australia, was having his weekly meetings in this transition point and he'd have his branch managers there and every week they'd be happy to talk about uh, what we used to call CLIs, uh, um, lines of credit that were irregular, uh, talk about the margin report that they were getting on their lending, talk about um, the kind of, uh, category A and category B and category C lending, talk about all the stuff that was about you know, capital B banking of credits and lending and transactional accuracy and lots of stuff. And the last item on the agenda was always, you know, and how are we going with sales figures? How are we going with cross-selling, you know, insurance on top of the home loans or selling a card with uh, whatever? And they always go, ah, oh, gee, we're out of time. Anyway, next week, next week. We'll do that next week for sure. And this went on, you know, always next week, next week, next week, as the group continued to avoid engaging with their responsibilities in the sales environment, which they now had to do. This was the new game, the new job that was available to them. And they kept on sticking with what they felt comfortable with, the credit stuff, the transactional stuff, and not doing the sales stuff. And Phil said, you know, my meeting got frustrated. He said, guys, do you know, when I was a kid, and my mum would cook dinner, and she put meat and three veg on the table for all of us to eat, and half the time she used to cook Brussels sprouts. And I hated Brussels sprouts. <laughs> And I would sit there and I'd eat my chops and I'd move the Brussels sprouts to the right. And I'd eat my carrots and I'd move the Brussels sprouts to the back of the plate. And I'd eat my potato and I'd leave, me leave the Brussels sprouts sitting there with it, you know. And then I'd try and put them under my knife and fork, pretend they weren't there, and try and leave the table. And mum say, no, you can't leave the table until you've finished your dinner. And he said, I realised one day that my strategy was flawed. Because every day what happens was all I end up with is a plate of cold Brussels sprouts and nothing to take the flavour away. And I wasn't going to leave the table until I'd eaten them. He said, imagine if we did the stuff that we didn't. He said, so what I'd learned to do was eat them first. And then I could eat the rest of it. I get the spuds because I love my spuds and I get the chops because they were always tasty and the carrots and the peas and whatever else mum was serving. But I had those Brussels sprouts out of the way. And Phil said, imagine if we got the stuff out of the way that we didn't like and they got to finish the meal with the things we did. And a whole bunch of nodding heads, you know, in that room going, yeah. Now, if he just berated them and said, you guys, you keep on avoiding the change, you know, that we need to do, and let's do, you know, like, but most people have their version of Brussels sprouts. Maybe it was broccoli for you, maybe, it, you know, I don't know what it was for you, but most of us had this thing that as kids we didn't really like eating, and most of us had you know, parents or caregivers that required us to eat it anyway. And most of us tried strategies of avoiding doing it. And most of us ended up um, uh, you know, having to do it anyway. And in fact, um, uh, you know, I wasn't a great fan of Brussels sprouts either as a kid. I now grow them. Uh, you know, I love them. Uh, cooked slightly differently to the way mother used to murder them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, um, so there's a springboard story. What's the change Phil had in mind? I want them to engage with the sales management stuff. Um, you know, uh, the protagonist was typical of the audience, uh, an experience they could relate to. There was a do-nothing consequence. Uh, they triumphed in the end, and he made the link back without slapping them over the, the head with it. So springboard stories help us kind of move through change by kind of almost skirting around it and then pulling people through it rather than pushing people through it. The second structure we have um, is personal stories. And these are essentially ethos stories that say, um, hey, I want you to understand something about me and what I stand for, because if you understand what I stand for, you might 
uh, be more drawn to the message I have regardless of what it is. Yeah? And a personal story has some particular characteristics as well. Um, the first is uh, it's implicit. Uh, so if you want people to understand you're good in a crisis, uh, don't say, <clears throat> uh, I'm good in a crisis. Yeah? Uh, you have to imply or have them work out what is this characteristic that you, know, you want them to know. The second thing is it's fractal. I mentioned that before. We know that events in our life, people extrapolate and say, if Cameron did that then, that's probably what he does. <clears throat> Many of you are uh, HR practitioners. It's a bit like behavioural event interviewing, isn't it? Tell me about a time when. Yeah? Have we ever used those words? Uh, you know, can you think of a time? And what we're saying is, well, okay, if you, so if you tell me that time, then my hope is when you come and work for me, you'll do that as a pattern. So we're, you know, that's essentially using a, a fractal as well through interviewing. So personal stories are fractal in nature. They're about a time that is characteristic of who you are. Uh, number three, they're authentic. <clears throat> they're, these ones are about you, and there's no point telling fibs. Uh, because you'll be found out, and the whole purpose here is to build credibility and trustworthiness as a, a change message provider. So they need to be authentic, <clears throat> and not just authentic as far as it goes. Uh, no one would have liked to have seen the uh, newspaper headline in the uh, uh, New York Times saying, you know, uh, um, celebrations today as 700 happy passengers disembarked the maiden voyage of the Titanic, uh, which is true. 700 made it home. It's not really truthful, though, is it? <laughs> Uh, number four, has a turning point, this moment where the person in the story, you, is tested <clears throat> and um, that has a positive outcome. You want to show people that you've triumphed in some way. So uh, this is the, the hero archetype uh, story we're, we're really tapping into here. Um, I was challenged and I triumphed. Number six uh, and seven, we want colour and emotion. We want to be able to place ourselves there and go, wow, what, are the, what was going on? What did it sound like? What did it, what, you know, what did it look like? And particularly, what did it feel like? What was going on for you? <clears throat> and uh, number eight, and finally, um, it is modest. Uh, and uh, it, so, again, it's a bit linked to implicit. We don't want to sort of uh, say at the end of it, and so you can see that's why wow, I'm quite an extraordinary leader. You know, just, um, so, yeah, something uh, more subtle than that is good. And we've all got personal stories. All of us are the people we are today through a series of events which have been the making of us. Things that have been times where we've found something out about ourselves, been tested in some way, stretched ourselves in some way, and we take that lesson with us into who we are. And some of those things sit deeply in our childhood. Some of those things are more recent. We've all got personal stories. Um, here's one. About three years or so ago, um, uh, when we were particularly busy at work, uh, and I guess I came to the conclusion that my employer was not going to look after my health and well-being. I needed to do that myself. I needed to take responsibility for my <coughs> state of hand, mind and my state of health, <clears throat> excuse me, as I'll do right now. <laughs> and um, I decided to take up running. One of my colleagues at work uh, started running and I thought, she'd come, home, uh, come um, back from lunch glowing. Uh, and I said, I want what Meg's having because she looks good every time she comes back in the afternoon. So I started running. And uh, I didn't just start running. Uh, I decided to run a marathon. Um, uh, and I'd never run further than 10k in my life before that, and even that was a stretch. But I decided that a marathon, that's, a, that's worth going for. So, I'm, I mean, I might have been mad, but I wasn't stupid. I uh, joined a running group and I engaged a coach and I trained hard and I got out there, I learned about interval running and tempo and, and long, slow distance and really learning to run properly. And uh, got out there and did the work uh, to, to kind of achieve this, this, you know, mad goal, really, this grand goal, I hoped. Um, and each week I'd run further and further as I was doing my long slow runs, 30k, 32k, 34k, 36k, uh, farther than I ever thought it was humanly possible to run, certainly further than I thought my, <clears throat> my ageing body could run. And so it came uh, at 7.30, one Saturday morning, October the 12th, I lined up with thousands of others and trotted off as a starting gun fired in the 2012 Mer Melbourne Marathon. And the good news is the training had worked. You know, I'm, I'm travelling along and I'm feeling good and <clears throat> I'm running around through uh, along the bay in Melbourne and a friend of mine was in the audience 
the audience, <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, the crowd. And, uh, and she called out to me, you know, hey, how you going, Cam? How are you feeling? And I quite genuinely responded, I feel great. I could do this all day. Uh, only it turns out I couldn't. <coughs> and there's this moment in the Melbourne Marathon where you head down uh, St Kilda Road in Melbourne. I don't know if you know Melbourne well. And you're heading towards uh, Flinders Street Station and you go around the corner and then down to the G, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, and that's where home is. That's the finish line. Uh, except that you don't. You get down there and all of a sudden they turn you backwards, away from the finish line, up a long, slow incline. And as I hit the 35, 36k mark and I turned away from the finish line, further than I've ever run before, up a hill, all of a sudden my legs felt like concrete. And my plantar fascia was hurting and my knee was hurting and my breathing became harder and my spirit broke. And this little voice inside me was saying, a seductive little voice saying, why don't we just stop? <laughs> You've done really well. <laughs> That's as far as anyone's ever run. <laughs> There'd be no shame in quitting now. Just quietly pop across the side and pretend you're part of the crowd. <laughs> <coughs> and it was so tempting. Every fibre of my body wanted to stop. Yep. And it wasn't just my body, it was my mind saying, enough, it was a dumb goal. What were you thinking? <laughs> but I hadn't committed to beginning a marathon. I'd committed to finishing a marathon. And I started to look deep inside myself and I started to really draw on the resources that I didn't even realise I had. I thought about, you know, the training I'd done and the work I'd put in and the reason I'd set this goal and I found something inside myself that I didn't even know I had, some set of resources or capabilities that said, this is possible. And so it was that on a beautiful spring morning with the sun on my back, uh, I came into the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the famous Melbourne Cricket Ground, ar <coughs> around the border and through the gantry and completed my first marathon in 3 hours and 34 minutes, which is not a bad time for an old fellow, first time marathoner, uh, with something approximating a smile on my face. <coughs> And, you know, this impossible task that in that moment I didn't think I could do, <clears throat> in that moment I wasn't sure that I had the resources to do, turned out to be not only possible, but I've now gone on to run several road marathons, <coughs> trail marathons, um, even an ultra marathon. This is me and my running buddy, Joe, coming uh, first mixed pair across the line in a 50 kilometre event last year. Um, in two weeks from now I head across to Chicago to run in my first international event. I'm running the Chicago Marathon. And that's a very, very different place to where I would have been if I'd listened to that seductive voice in that moment saying, why don't we just stop? <laughs> and I carry that with me in the work that I do about, you know, sometimes the great goals that we set, they need to be audacious. They need to be stretching us. And we're capable of far more than we, than we realise. Anyway, that's my story. Um, time now for yours. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about uh, a characteristic which is part of you, which you know to be part of you, an attribute or characteristic, that if your people, whoever your people are, the teams that report to you, the um, groups that you serve you know, as change agents or as HR managers or as leaders or you know, whatever roles you take on, think of an attribute or characteristic which you would like others to understand about you. That if they understood that about you, they might be more drawn to you as a leader. You might be uh, someone they can relate to, someone they can be drawn to, someone they can admire or respect or follow through the flames of change. I want you to think about that attribute. Now, <clears throat> you know that attribute to be true, that characteristic to be true, because you've been tested at some point. You've found it to be true. So I want you to think of a time or an incident when you were <clears throat> attested on that attribute, where it became apparent to you that this thing that's in within you now was obvious, came to the fore. Um, and I particularly want you to focus on that moment of being tested or trialled or um, just coming to know that this is something about you, that you hold to be true about your identity and what you're capable of or what you stand for or what matters to you, what you value. I want you now, individually for a moment, but you know what's coming next, <coughs> um, uh, to think about this, this characteristic. Think about this incident and think about the turning point. Can I just, I'll show you one more uh, thing. Um, 
Uh, one of the things I used to do uh, for recreation was improvised theatre, walking out on the stage with no idea what's going to happen next and hoping that something would happen. And one of the great uh, leaders of Impro, um, an Englishman originally now lives in Canada, uh, Keith Johnson, the creator of Theatre Sports and a guerrilla theatre, maestro theatre. Some of you might have seen these. Uh, there's a very active um, uh, Impro community in New Zealand, particularly in Christchurch. And um, he has this uh, way of working with actors and they'll be doing a scene and with, you know, in a workshop and there'll be people watching and he'll walk up to someone and give them a direction very quietly and what he says to them is, be less interesting. Just be less interesting. Because sometimes, you know, you see them, new actors, they try and be actors and everything's like melodrama, you know, and there's actually nothing interesting about that. There's something about the reality and the minutiae of our life which is actually draws us in. And so my uh, encouragement, my invitation to you as you think about this, the story that you're about to create the bones of, not a fully fledged piece of art, be less interesting, yeah? Do bad art, write a terrible story. Um, so this is the task now, yep, think about uh, a personal characteristic or attribute that you hold, that's important, that you'd like others to know about you. Think of a time when it was apparent, in particular focus on the uh, outcome. Uh, do that now. Um, I'm going to give you some thinking about story music for about two minutes, yeah, and, um, and then uh, I'm going to get you to share. Your time starts now. <laughs> Can you... Can you feel the energy as people tell and receive stories? Can you see the interest that people have in your story? And many of you might have been thinking, oh, I'm not sure if this is good enough or this probably isn't right or, you know. And yet um, the engagement, the level of, of uh, as I said, energy and excitement in the room is palpable. Um, and I would have loved to have let it go on, but I'm also conscious that I want to make it possible for you to get to the keynote speaker in a moment. <clears throat> um, you know, story, story sits deeply within us. Story has power uh, to engage people, to have people listen to us, to have people understand us, to have people believe in us, to have people act on our messages. And we could spend all of our days, you know, sharing facts and figures and data and logic and analysis. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And as leaders of change, we not only have to have good change ideas, but we need people to buy in and move forward on those change ideas. And one of the most powerful ways that we'll ever do that is wrapping those ideas and the resistance we encounter, which is normal, natural and predictable, uh, and working with story as a way of working with people uh, towards our grand vision. Um, I'll leave you with this quote um, from Terry Pratchett. Um, uh, I hope that you can find ways of incorporating both the telling, the listening and perhaps the triggering of stories in your organisations as you lead them to whatever future that uh, sit in front of them. Thank you for your time this morning. <clears throat>